Hello everyone and welcome back to Queen Elizabeth, The Day in Her Life. In the last video we had the Duke and Duchess giving speeches with a bit of fear but handling it well. And they were also trying to find the right house to live in. Queen Alexandra passed away sadly and then the highlight came with the birth of Princess Elizabeth, a happy event for all the families. In this episode we find ourselves traveling to Australia with the Duke and Elizabeth. It should be exciting. So let's find out what they're up to now. The Duke and the Duchess were on the ship HMS Renown for six months. That's a long time. It was a ship that launched from Glasgow in 1916. The ship was in the Great War for the last two years of the war. In 1919 to 1920, the ship carried the Prince of Wales on a voyage to Australia and America. The tour was important not only for the government of Australia, but also for the king. Even with the importance, they had to operate on a tight budget. The Prince of Wales, who was unmarried at the time, was given £25,000 for his tour of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand in 1919 to 1920. And when the King and Queen, who were then the Duke and Duchess of York, had gone to Australia 25 years before, they were allowed £20,000. The Duke was prepared to pay out of his own pocket any charges he and the Duchess would be called upon in their daily routine. In the end, the government offered £3,500 up front, with another £3,500 promised in March 1927. Of this, £175 was granted for clothes allowance to each of the five male members of the staff, £125 each to the Duchess's two ladies-in-waiting, and £325 for the Duke and Duchess between them. They had to spend a great deal more out of their own resources to cover the expenses of the trip, even that didn't satisfy some of the Labour members of Parliament who objected to the £7,000 grant. They called it a joy ride. In reality, it was tiring. The Duke and the Duchess's duties was to represent not just Britain herself, but the whole British Empire. The Admiral in charge of the fitting the ship was Admiral Parker, and he was a little nervous about it. The Duchess requested blue in the cabins, and Parker thought she would get tired of the blue. She rejected his first blue suggestions, and she didn't want stripes either. Parker accepted the required blue, ordered more cushions, and he sent the ship's barber to Trumpers in Curzon Street to learn how the Duke liked his haircut. Parker felt that the ladies would get tired of knitting, so he got books from the Times Book Club. Uh, they loaned the ship 120 books for a charge of 12 guineas. The selection reflected what was popular in that time. It included Edgar Wallace, P.G. Woodenhouse, and John Buchanan. All were favorites of the Duchess. John Galsworthy, Agatha Christie, Radcliffe Hall, John Maysfield, Arthur and Conan Doyle, and Sapper, who was an adventure story writer. Parkers of Piccadilly lent them a selection of framed prints for the cabins to make things feel more like home. Pathé Frey's Cinema LTD sent films for watching on the ship. They had three comedies starring Harold Lloyd and B.B. Daniels. Uh, they were called Modes and Madness, Heap Big Chief and Hustling Herald, and two song films were music, Swanee River and Coming Through the Rye. Alfred Hayes' gramophone agency lent them electric gramophone. The 78 RPMs were provided by the gramophone company and chosen by the Duke and the Duchess's taste. They had a selection of Kressler, the Brahms Hungarian dances, some of the older Harry Lauder songs, Gilbert and Sullivan, and some Chopin. And Ampico reproducing piano was lent by Sir Herbert Marshall and Sons for shipboard dances. The gramophone and the piano had some damage from the rough seas and they needed serious repairs afterwards. And the cellar of the ship, there were more than 60 cases of vintage champagne from various suppliers, 58 cases of the Duke's favorite whiskey, uh, Buchanan's 12 cases of brandy from Justerini and Brooks, 12 cases of Gordon's gin, French and Italian vermouth, 40 cases of port, 18 cases of sherry, and 30 cases of claret. The Duke and the Duchess liked cocktails before lunch and dinner and drank champagne throughout the meal. Bulgarian cigarettes were provided by the Navy, and the Duke liked to smoke. Media was involved to keep track of the journey. They had an official photographer, W.J. Fair, and two movie cameramen. An official film was produced by the Commonwealth Government of Australia and distributed by the European Motion Picture Company. A similar film was produced in New Zealand. 
Hundreds of thousands of people all over the world could see what was going on. They also had a writer to keep track of the journey, an Australian journalist, Taylor Derbyshire, and he wrote a book about the voyage. The king made the Earl of Cavan chief of staff for the tour. His task was to see that everything ran as smoothly as possible and that all formalities demanded by the king were met. And the king insisted that the duke and duchess wear the correct dress for every occasion, and he sent frequent instructions by coded telegram. On the voyage, they went the Atlantic route via Las Lamas, Jamaica, and then through the Panama Canal to the Pacific. The weather wasn't cooperating. The Duchess wrote in her diary, hardly slept at all last night, and kept jumping up to put things away. Even the big gramophone fell over. The Duchess, she was a good sailor, and she wrote to Darcy Osborne that the ship was beautiful in a clean, large way, and the food was quite good, and she begged him to write to her. She said that she already felt cut off. When the weather got better, the Duke and Duchess made themselves popular with all ranks on board. The Duke made casual visits to the ward room to talk to the senior officers, which pleased them. Then they dined with the junior officers and the gun room, and they played charades and nursery games and danced the Charleston with some of the midshipmen. The Duchess had time to rest and read and talk. She also missed baby Elizabeth. She wrote in her diary, felt depressed. I miss the baby all the time and I'm always wondering what she is doing. It had to be hard to be away from her like that, and it was such a long period of time. They did have some diversions, though. There was clay pigeon shooting from the deck, the ship's rifle range and squash court, and every Sunday there was a church service on board, and the Duchess enjoyed the hearty singing of the crew. January the 10th, they anchored off the Canary Islands in warm weather, but the waves were high. Spanish officials in Las Palmas were supposed to come on board, but they declined because of the rough seas. So the Duke and Duchess boarded a barge to be taken ashore, and the Duchess was said to have gazelle-like agility getting on the barge. The national anthem was hard to recognize when it was played by the local band. The next day the renowned set sail for Jamaica. The first stage of the trip had gone well. The king was micromanaging from home, and he didn't like how the Duchess' clothing was described. Later, the king gave a message of encouragement to the Duke and Duchess just before they got to Auckland. It was a good pick-me-up for them. January 20th, the Duke and Duchess landed at Kingston, and the streets were lined with cheering people. On the second day, they went to the cathedral at Spanish Town, and then they went to a garden party in the center of the island. People were happy, and it was the first time that any member of the royal family had visited the interior. Cavan reported to the king that the Duchess is looking so fresh and well. Back at the king's house in Kingston, uh, the Duke played a doubles match, and he was, he was partnered with a Jamaican of color, and he was one of the best players in the island. The Duchess's personality worked overseas as it had at home. It would contribute greatly to the success of the tour. Cavan sent the king an editorial from the Daily Gleaner of Kingston and how she smiled her way into the hearts of the people. Her kindly glances the sweetness of her manner, her whole attitude of gracious charm have won her a love which must last as long as those who have seen her shall live. And there was power in her smile. From Jamaica they set sail and the heat. Cabin temperatures got to 86 degrees and they started to sleep on the deck and they were headed to the Panama Canal. The Duchess wrote the Prince of Wales from Panama. Her letters to him were affectionate, frank, and humorous, almost like how she wrote to her brothers. The Panamanian press were enchanted by the Duchess. They wrote what clothes Elizabeth wore, and the reporter described the Duke as a slight, slender English boy in a white uniform, and beside him was a sweet, pretty, charming young woman gowned in a fetching morning gown of pale lavender and carrying a white silk parasol. The man raised his hand to his helmet in a salute, and the little woman waved her handkerchief in goodbye. There was a large crowd waiting for them, as they went through the locks at Pedro Miguel. A young Britisher resident on Isthmus waved his hat and shouted to his, Her Royal Highness, How's the baby? And the Duchess leaned over the railing and replied, Baby's fine. And the Duchess was really missing her baby, which was understandable. The telegrams I got from the nanny weren't too detailed, which didn't help. On one, the nanny said, All right, night. And when the Duchess was in Panama, she telegraphed home, and said that no messages had arrived, please send news at once. And while they were crossing the Pacific, 
the Duke and the Duchess seemed to dread the exhaustion that lay ahead. The Duke wrote to his brother that the voyage was long and monotonous. He was feeling depressed. They both felt cut off from home, and all news came from a wireless bulletin which only meant China and football results. The Duchess wrote to the Queen, and the Duchess said she worried that baby Elizabeth might be sick. She said to the Queen Mary, I do hope you like having the baby and that she continues to be well and happy and no colds. I miss her quite terribly, and the five weeks we have been away seem like five months. I bet it did. <laughs> so the Queen wrote to her, tell her and the Duke that she heard that Elizabeth had cut her first tooth, which was good news. Queen Mary said that Dr. Still had prevented Princess Elizabeth from visiting them at Sandringham because she had eye trouble and was teething. Queen Mary and the King were disappointed, but they agreed, and she said the weather there had been much better than anywhere else. When the Queen and the King got back to London, Princess Elizabeth arrived at Buckingham Palace to stay with them. Queen Mary wrote that she was looking too sweet and seems happy in her new surroundings. She liked the pair at Charlotte, and she watched the bird eating pips with an air of absorption. How nice Allah is, and the baby has turned out too beautifully. The king wrote about her, too. He couldn't help but make criticisms, though, of his son's appearance or the sense of protocol when he saw fit. Next, they went to the island of Nuka Hiva and the French Marquise. It was a simple place with only four ships coming in there a year. Well, they were happy to leave the ship to walk, to fish, and to bathe. And one evening... The islanders danced for them. The Duke and the Duchess liked dancing on the quarter deck, and she found the midshipmen light on their feet. After they left Fiji, they made landfall in New Zealand. Two days before they got there, there was a cable from the King and Queen reminding them of the seriousness of their task, and this was the first stage of their mission. The Duchess liked New Zealand and the people right away. Caven reported to the king that the Duchess looked radiant as they landed, and they were taken to the packed town hall for the official welcome. The duke gave a speech, and after the first two or three sentences, it was fluently and forcefully spoken. The duke was happy about the speech. He told his mother he had to make three speeches on the first day they arrived. He said he had perfect confidence in himself, and he didn't hesitate at all. He said that Logue's teaching was working well, and when he got, but when he got tired, it still worried him. New Zealand was supposed to be the least demanding part of the tour, but the long days of public exposure in New Zealand, it was exhausting for both of them. Their welcome seemed to be endless. Engagements were piled upon each other. The Duke wrote his mother that these tours were arranged by the ministers, whose one and only idea was more votes. So they saw to it that they went to all the small towns and their constituencies. New Zealand had a small police force of a thousand men, and they had trouble controlling the large crowds. The Duchess even changed the heart of a communist agitator in Auckland. He met with Joseph Coates, the Prime Minister, and he said he was done with communism. The Prime Minister asked why he changed his mind, and he said, why, they're human. Yesterday I was in the crowd with the wife and one of the children, and he said he waved his hand, and I'm blessed if the Duchess didn't wave back and smile right into my face, not two yards away. I'll never say a word against him again. I've done with it for good and all. The king then was told the story. The Duchess was a very real factor in the success of the tour. She complimented the Duke's shyness by a radiance. The Duke rose to the challenge of the trip, though. He had an interest in the country and in the views of the people, which won, won him some affection. The Duke liked to ride and shoot and fish, and that endeared him to the people because they had a sporting ethic. The Duchess wrote to Queen Mary, the marvelous loyalty of the people of New Zealand is quite amazing, and any mention of the king and the queen of the mother country, the empire or home, brings out such very genuine and wholehearted tears that it gives one quite a lump in the throat. Both of them express an interest in the children there. The Duchess told the queen that the children were so well looked after here, so different to England, and that they come first in everything. They are taught to be loyal to the crown before anything, and they're taught to be well and healthy and clean. Then they had a fishing weekend in the Bay of Islands. The Duke caught a 150-pound shark, and the Duchess had success with a snapper. On the fishing trip, they went to, on another fishing break, they went to Cow High Fishing Camp at Tokanu, and they loved it. The Duke wrote in his diary that it was the most marvelous camp I've ever seen. All tents were beautifully furnished and fitted with electric light, 
and a water supply even in the laboratories. The Duchess caught an eight-pound trout. It was the first one she ever caught. And Lord Cavan praised the Duke for his new confidence and said that the Duchess was splendid and that she never appeared tired. But I guess he jinxed her when he said that because in reality she was exhausted. And by March the 9th, she had a temperature of 102 and the ship advised her that she couldn't go on in, that, in her condition. Being sick was a blow for the Duke. His staff knew when he was tired he would be nervous and snap, but his wife was always able to soothe him. His first thought was to cancel the tour, but he decided that the duty demanded that he do it, and he did. I will stop the video here, and we'll find out how the Duke fares without Elizabeth by his side during the New Zealand tour. In this episode, we saw how much preparation was needed for their six months' journey to go to Australia. Well, nowadays, it still takes some time to get to Australia, but not six months. And the Duke and Duchess got down sometimes thinking of their daughter, and they had to wait a while to get the news about their daughter, so they were always worried that she was okay. Everywhere they stopped, the crowds were happy to have them visit. That made the Duke and Duchess feel welcome. The Duchess really won the hearts of the people with her radiant personality, and the Duke was well-received too, but he was more reserved. I hope everyone enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. I hope everybody's been having a good day, and tune in again soon for another episode of Queen Elizabeth, A Day in Her Life. Thank you. Bye.